I'm a professor at the University of Washington, and um, I have a broad background. So I was, I was educated in engineering, and engineering is applied to biology, but uh, I guess I've, I've worn so many hats during, during my career. I, I started trying to figure out or trying to model the mechanical behavior of the cardiovascular system. And pretty soon I got into muscle, trying to figure out how muscles work at the molecular level. There's a theory that's been around for, oh, since the mid-1950s, and it was put forth by a, a very distinguished Nobel laureate, Sir Andrew Huxley. And, and we had evidence that his theory actually didn't fit the evidence, and so um, I spent, or we spent in my laboratory, we spent decades uh, performing experiments and trying to see uh, how the results of those experiments, uh, what, what they implied in terms of the molecular mechanism of contraction. And after that, we started to get involved with water, and you might, you might ask, how, does, how do muscles relate to water? Well, you know, there's a, actually a pretty close relationship because muscles, just like other tissues in everybody's body, they're about two-thirds water. Um, and the odd thing is that the theory that prevailed didn't even mention water. It was though the contents of the muscles existed in a vacuum with nothing around the proteins uh, that were thought or are thought responsible for producing the contraction. We, uh, uh, we, we thought after seeing the results of many experiments and, and much theory that the water had to be involved in some way. I mean, it's unimaginable that, that two-thirds of the volume of the muscle had nothing to do at all with, with the contraction. Most people consider the water to be a background carrier of the more important molecules of life, like the proteins and DNA and, and RNA. But long ago, people realized that water was really important. And, 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 and some people, particularly one Gilbert Ling, who uh, is now 96 or 97 years old and has contributed monumentally to the field, he and various other people thought that water was really important for everything that the body does. And we picked up on this and came to realize that in, in muscle and also other tissues in the body that water was not merely a, an innocent bystander to what happened, but was in fact centrally involved in, in the whole process. And so, so I, I, I gradually um, moved or shifted from my interest in muscle, which I still have somewhat, to a, a deep interest in water, and we, if you pardon the expression, we immersed ourselves deeply in, in, in the water. And, and at first, it, it was a book that I produced in 2001. It's called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. And the book brought up the, the idea or pre presented evidence that, that, um, that, that what goes on in cells biologically um, pretty much all of the major, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, not features, but the major attributes or the major functions uh, of a cell, that water was not just merely an, a bystander to what happens, but played a, a pivotal role, a central role in, in the action of the cell. And for example, in, in, in the area of muscle contraction, uh, water, is, is deeply involved in the process. And in fact, we were able to conclude that the transition of water from one state to another state was critical in triggering the, the contraction itself. And then restoring the initial state requires energy, putting the muscle back into a state where it's ready to contract another time. So um, and that led to, to experiments on, on water. And this, is, this has been occupying us now for the, for the past decade. And um, we, we got a, a wonderful grant from the National Institutes of Health uh, 
it's called a transformative grant, and it's, it's meant for ideas that have the capacity to transform science. And we use this grant to do um, a series of, of exper extensive experiments that demonstrated something about water that, that, that is, is not part of current science, that people thought, or scientists thought perhaps a, a century ago might, m might be possible, but we provided the evidence, and that is for a, a, a fourth phase of water. So we all, we all grow up knowing that water has three phases, the solid phase, the liquid phase, and the vapor phase. Everybody knows that. A hundred years ago, um, it, it was proposed by um, a, a distinguished physical chemist, um, Sir William Hardy, that actually there might be a fourth phase of water because starting with the three phases, it was not possible to explain all the known features and behaviors of water. So he said, the three doesn't work, you gotta add a fourth one. Well, I think we discovered the fourth one and we call it the fourth phase of water. And it's a phase that is crystalline or semi-crystalline in nature. And it, it builds uh, when water meets certain solid interfaces, uh, that is mostly hydrophilic surfaces, water-loving surfaces, the water transforms itself in, into a, a very different structure. And it happens not just at a single molecular layer that meets this, this surface, but many, many, it projects out over many, many molecular layers, millions, up to millions of these layers. And, and this water has many interesting features, um, uh, which you know, I, I, I can talk about, but it's all, it all culminates in, in a book that I wrote in uh, 2013 called The Fourth Phase of Water uh, beyond solid, liquid, and vapor. And yeah, I'm pleased to say that the book has, has become a bestseller with, with um, very gratifying reviews because it's written in, in a way that, I mean, the audience, it, it's, it's meant for non-experts, so anybody can pick it up and, and read it. I, I, I guess I subscribe to, to uh, the, the aphorism stated maybe initially by Niels Bohr, who is the guy who's responsible for the structure of the atom. And, and he said, this was a hundred years ago, he said, more than a hundred years ago, he said that any idea that has real merit should be explainable to your grandmother. Well, you know, at that time, there were not many grandmothers who were theoretical physicists. Now there are, so maybe the, it doesn't apply, but, but, but essentially, yeah, I, I subscribe to, to the notion that it's been accepted from the Middle Ages from Sir William of Ockham, known as Ockham's Razor, that if you, got, if you have uh, two ideas, uh, competing ideas to explain a given phenomenon, probably the simplest one is the one that is going to be correct. And so, so in, in our efforts, both in the field of muscle contraction and most recently in the past decades, in, in the field of, of water, the idea is to, is to arrive at an understanding that's really simple. And I think this actually is quite simple. So anyway, that's a, a description of where our work has evolved from, from the beginning of my career to where it stands today. It is a, a good question. Does, does water play a, a role in cell function? Well, <laughs> The, the short answer is yes, and it plays a, a, a really central role in function. So, first of all, think about, uh, about our cells. Uh, I mentioned our cells are two-thirds water. That's, that's actually two-thirds by volume. All right, and the question is, if you count all the molecules in the cell, all line them up, you know, and count them, it turns out that that 99, more than 99 out of 100 of the molecules are water molecules because in order to fill that two-thirds volume, you've got these very small water molecules and you need a lot of them to fill that volume. So, so the, the first point is, is that more than 99% of our molecules are water molecules. In current biological understanding, 
uh, puts the water molecules in a secondary, even maybe tertiary position. They really don't count. They just sit there. It's like a bathtub. And, and throw in, into the bathtub of the cell, throw in the proteins and the nucleic acids and the ions and such, and they're what counts. The water is just sitting there to bathe all of those Im important elements. So it, it seems, first of all, to be um, maybe slightly arrogant to think that 99% of the molecules in your cells or in your body don't do nothing. <laughs> they ain't. They ain't there for anything important, but they just sit there. And th this, is a, this is a convenient idea, and this, is, this idea has, has, uh, uh, has developed over the past 50 or so years. Before that, everybody knew that water counts, and especially one, one good example of this is, is uh, Albert St. Georgi. Uh, and St. Georgi, many people don't know this, this name, but St. Georgi is considered to be the father of modern biochemistry. He discovered vitamin C. He got a Nobel Prize. He was deeply interested in, 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 in many uh, biological functions, in, including uh, uh, cancer, including electrons in the cell, and many areas. And, and people, even Nobel laureates, looked up to him as a really a, a Nobel laureate among Nobel laureates. He happens to be also one of, one of my heroes. And one of the things that he said, uh, he had a deep interest in water. He said, life is water dancing to the tune of solids. So he knew that, that the behavior of water, the movements of water, were central to, uh, to, to everything in biology. And one of the reasons that was forgotten is, you know, in, in his time, you couldn't really take the cell and pull it apart into its component uh, pieces. You studied, it was a kind of holistic study of, of the cell. And from the evidence that he'd obtained, he knew that the water was, was something, it was like the matrix of life that held everything together um, and, and participated in, in all of the chemical reactions inside the cell. So gradually, you know, with, with the advent of modern technology, it became possible to pull apart the uh, molecules of the cell. And so you could look at individual molecules. You could even look at parts of molecules to see how they were behaving. And, and in this process of refinement and of getting down to the most, you might say, fundamental uh, parts of the cell, the idea of water was forgotten because because um, uh, uh, the, the water is not part of that equation. And so people lost sight of, of the importance of uh, water in, in cell biology and focused instead on the, on the parts and even the parts of parts. And then many, many technologies developed to study those, those parts. And, and in, in so doing, over the past decades, we've had a tendency to forget about the water. OK, and so, so the evidence that, that we have, not only from the evidence from beyond 50 years ago, but the modern evidence that we and other groups have been able to, to create, um, uh, this evidence shows that water plays a very major role. And I guess I can summarize the role that water plays in, in a, a, few, um, a few statements or paragraphs, if, if you will. The first is, what, what kind of water is there inside the cell? And we think of, of the water as H2O, of course. Everybody knows liquid H2O. But the odd thing about the cell is, is uh, if you think of it as ordinary liquid water, the same water as this that you might like to drink, which I will, mm. this is liquid water. If you do this, it pours out. But if you cut a cell, it doesn't come out. <laughs> it's an odd thing. And so the water inside the cell is demonstrably different from the liquid water that we consider. And from our work, it's clear that the water that's in the cell is actually a kind of gel-like water. And that gel-like water is, is the fourth phase of water whose properties we discovered and uh, I elaborated in, in the book that I uh, I, I mentioned. And 
what happens is that this, this fourth phase water, it's a kind of uh, considered to be a kind of interfacial water that, that is, it occurs at interfaces, it occurs next to charged solids. Inside the cell, the cell is full of charged solids. The proteins, for example, are charged solids. The nucleic acids are charged solids. And even the ions uh, basically are charged. And, and, and all of these surfaces next to them build the fourth phase of water. We call it easy water sometimes, so I apologize if I refer to it easy. Easy represents exclusion zone. And we gave it that name early on because this kind of water, this crystal-like water, when it builds, it excludes solutes. So we called it exclusion zone water, or short, easy water. So easy water, fourth phase water, it's the same thing. Uh, so this water actually sits inside the cell, this easy or fourth phase water. And if you think of, uh, of, of what it does, so, so let's say this is a protein sitting here. And the job of the protein uh, is, let's say, in a contracting muscle cell. Different cells have different jobs to do. In a muscle cell, the job of the muscle cell is to contract. And so all the molecules, uh, the protein molecules, may do something, may bend or, or twist or turn or do something It cha changes its configuration to do the work of the cell. However, when we're born, uh, this protein is fully surrounded by easy fourth phase water. As we get older or as we have uh, some sort of pathology, this easy water is disrupted. You don't have enough of it. So you have the protein that's sitting there and it doesn't have the water. It's not sitting in its natural environment. And so because it's not in its natural environment, it can't, it can't bend or turn or twist the way it's supposed to. And so the protein folding is not normal, and therefore the function of the cell is not normal. Therefore, your muscles are not contracting the way they should. Therefore, you have a certain pathology, which hopefully is, is, is reversible. So when you think of reversing the pathology, first thing you think of in that kind of contextual framework is to build easy water inside the cell. And there are, there are many indications that building easy water is actually good for your cells and good for your health. And so let, let me explain that. How do, you, how do you build easy water? Well, the, the most, most obvious way is to drink more water you know, we all tend, especially as we, our hair tends to get gray, we tend to be dehydrated. And we don't feel dehydration, but, but we know uh, from various studies that you, you drink more water and uh, obviously you, you get hydrated. And by getting hydrated, it means the water actually converts from ordinary water that you drink to easy water. And your, your body does that. Or um, you can drink the water from plants, which is already easy water. So many people engage in juicing, that is to take uh, uh, freshly uh, grown vegetables, green vegetables for example, and put, put it through a machine that squeezes it, pulverizes it, and from out of that comes the juice. And you drink your juice and, and uh, ma many practitioners of so-called alternative medicine or health enthusiasts know that drinking this water is, is good for your health. And they drink it and basically it restores the missing um, fourth phase water from your cells just by replacing it with what, what you drink. Um, the, the idea that the drinking the water is, is so important for your health, uh, there's a great book um, that describes it. The, the author is fondly known as Batman, <laughs> but his real name is Bat, Bat and, um, uh but it's too complicated to pronounce and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. But, but his book, his book uh, was published some time ago and it's a bestseller on Amazon. It's cheap and, I, and uh, according to Batman's son, who, who I met inadvertently on a plane, when the flight attendant tried to pronounce his name and he said, oh, just call me Batman. I knew who he was and it turns out it was correct. So he told me that his father's uh, book is, was a, uh, a one that more than seven million copies. 
So it's very popular. And, and the circumstances under which he wrote the book are, are pretty interesting. So he was, he grew up in, in, as a physician uh, in, in, um, uh, in Iran. And he was a supporter of the Shah of Iran. And when the Shah was deposed, naturally all of his supporters became political prisoners and were thrown in, 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 into prison. And he was a physician, so all of the other, other prisoners who were not exactly in the best of health under the conditions of those uh, prisons, they had only him to turn to for their health. And, you know, his office, so to speak, um, was not uh, re replete with the, the modern antibiotics or anything. All he had was water. So he told those people, irrespective of their problem, he said, just drink a lot of water. It turned out that these people were cured by the water, by drinking ample amounts of water. And he studied this not only in prison, but after he was released from prison. He stayed there an extra year to complete his studies on the prisoners, but he did other studies on his patients afterward and then wrote the book. And the classic book, it comes in various names, and one of them is called, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. In other words, you think you're sick and you've got a problem, um, and, and um, the problem is that you don't have enough water. Drink more water, and parenthetically, much of that, or some of that water gets converted to easy water and fills your cells with the water that you need, and then you, you become healthy. And um, so many people have read this, and many people understand that hydration is critically important for, uh, for everything. And, and his, his book provides what we might call anecdotal evidence to support that point of view. So how is, how is water, uh, easy water, important for health? How is easy water important for, for health? Um, and I gave you one example is drinking water, which can, gets converted to easy water, or actually drinking easy water, both, both of which populate your cells with abundant easy water and, and, uh, and confer health. There are other ways of doing it, um, and, and other ways coincide with, with what health practitioners know is good for health. So one example um, is connecting yourself to the earth or earthing. Now, it's well known, but but many people don't, don't know it, don't realize it, um, that the earth is negatively charged. I had no concept of this idea until about 10 years ago when, uh, when a, a, a Russian colleague who was working in my laboratory, uh, slightly younger than I, told me on his way out, uh, going to the airport to return to Russia after six months in my lab, uh, he quickly told me something about the Earth's electric field. And I said, Andre, you must have that wrong. You're speaking of the Earth's magnetic field. He said, no, no, electric field. And I said, you're crazy. I mean, I began my academic life studying electrical engineering, and I knew that, when, that the ground was zero, neutral electric potential. And you're telling me that the Earth is negatively charged? This is crazy. I never heard such an idea, and that this electric charge on the surface of the Earth creates an electric field with the ionosphere positive, the Earth negative, and therefore electric field lines penetrating down. I said, you're crazy. He said, you're crazy. He said, in Russia, he said, or Soviet Union at the time, every middle, every middle school student knew that the Earth was negatively charged. In the US, I would w wager that almost no middle school students have ever heard of the idea that the Earth was negatively charged. So for me, it was, it was really weird. Next day, one of my students came to me with the legendary um, lectures um, that, that um, uh, the, Nobel, the, the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman wrote. These lectures in, in book form. Are, are studied by practically every physics graduate student in, in the US. And in volume two, chapter nine, an entire chapter is devoted to the Earth's negative electrical charge. And in, in that chapter, Feynman discusses uh, many experiments that demonstrate it. These experiments are not done these days, but 
they were done, they are clear, there's no conflict, the earth is negatively charged. And so, we all have the feeling of walking on the beach barefoot, uh, and, and we feel good when we do that for some reason, you know, and, um, or uh, taking a mud bath in Japan, uh, connecting, basically connecting ourselves to the earth, and the earth is negatively charged, so what happens is that this negative charge seeps into our body and it helps build easy water. Easy water is negatively charged, you see, and, um, and this negative charge that you absorb helps build the easy water, and the buildup of easy water puts our cells back in toward their natural condition, and we feel better, and that includes our brain. You know, if we feel depressed or something is not functioning properly with our brain, if we can get additional negative charge, we feel better. So this is yet another way uh, that seems to work uh, to build our health through building the easy water inside our cells. A uh, third way, or fourth way, I can't remember where, where we are right now, is uh, going to a sauna. So the Finns do this all the time, um, and the Russians do it as well, they call it banya. And I remember some of my own experiences, uh, particularly I was, I was in Finland attending a conference, I spent a good part of the day talking. I was tired. Then there was a dinner and a party, and we were bused to this special resort. And it was 10 or 11 p.m., and all I could do was wait for that bus to take us back to the hotel so I can hit the sack. But at 10 p.m., they announced that the saunas were now available. There were three or four of them, each with a different temperature, a different degree of humidity and such. And I decided, what the hell, let's do it. So I took off my clothes, went into the, the men's one, uh, the women were, were separate, sat there for 20 minutes. And after I emerged, took a shower, it felt like morning. It felt like I'd had eight hours sleep. I was full of energy, ready to go. Uh, dancing was appealing, uh, moving around, talking, whatever. The last thing I wanted was to go home and hit the sack. So, and I experienced much the same in Russia in, in, in their banya. So the question is, okay, well, why does this occur? Is it, is it just a psychological issue? Or is there, is there something about the sauna or the banya that does it? Well, if you think about it, it the, the, the uh, sauna um, is hot. It generates radiant energy, and the radiant energy is in the infrared region. The infrared light, if you will, infrared energy, we found is exactly the energy that's required to build the easy water. The more infrared you get, the more easy water you get. We demonstrated that in, in the laboratory, and the effect is really powerful. You don't need much of it to build easy water. So, if you think about it, inside your cell you have easy water. If you don't have enough of it, you're not functioning very well. If you can get more of it, you function better. And by supplying the infrared energy, what the sauna is doing is building your easy water. Therefore, you, you feel better. So that's yet uh, another way to, uh, to, to, to um, build your health through, through easy water. And, and finally, actually, there, there are actually a couple more. Um, um, one of them, um, one of them is hyperbaric medicine. This is something that many people don't know about, but, but um, hyperbaric medicine um, is used, was used many years ago to, to um, repair wounds that were stubborn and wouldn't, wouldn't heal. It was used in, in the military. They found that if you put the patient into this chamber with high oxygen and high pressure, the wounds that were resistant to healing would actually heal. It was the only way they could get them to heal. Well, since then, hyperbaric medicine has been, hyperbaric chambers have been tried for up to something like 30 syndromes, according to a colleague of mine who works in, uh, in, in a company that, that produces them. And it's very odd because how could, how could the mechanism impact so, so many different 
pathologies at the same time? Well, the common element could be water, because water is everywhere in every one of the, of the organs. And, um, so we did some experiments simulating um, what is done in a hyperbaric chamber. We, we took a chamber in which we show, had built an exclusion zone or fourth phase water. We subjected to first increasing oxygen, and we found that the increasing oxygen built the fourth phase or easy water. No, no surprise, just like in the hyperbaric machine. Then we tried to increase pressure, and we found that also increased the amount of, of easy water. So when you put them together, high pressure and high oxygen, this is a powerful technique to build easy water. And I think it's quite likely that it's the buildup of easy water in whatever cells happen to be pathological, doesn't matter whether it's the wound or whether it's your lung or your heart or, or your brain, this is going to, to Im improve it. And finally, I, I feel like I'm a, a, an encyclopedia <laughs> going down the list of items that, that can improve health. But finally, we get to simple items like aspirin. So, aspirin, you know, you might ask yourself, well, why is aspirin so effective? Aspirin is natural. It comes from the bark of a, a willow tree. And why is it so effective? So it, it turns out, <coughs> excuse me, that if you, if you list the number of attributes of aspirin, so, okay, it reduces pain, it reduces fever, it reduces swelling, um, uh, it's good for your heart. It's been reported an aspirin a day keeps the cardiologist away. Uh, and even I saw reported in the New York Times a year or two ago, a group from Harvard studied women with breast cancer. And it turned out that after being diagnosed with breast cancer, those women who took one aspirin a day, their survival rate was much better than those that didn't. So, so aspirin has myriad uh, effects and again you ask the question could, is it possible that aspirin has a half dozen or more different mechanisms by which it works or is there a single mechanism that operates in, in many areas of, of your body to produce healing and, and so by Occam's razor the, the, the second hypothesis is simpler that it, that it has one mechanism and it operates in many places, and what would that mechanism be? So we would say that possibly the aspirin builds easy water, and then it doesn't matter what the issue is or what the organ is, if it builds easy water, if it has that capability, then it's gonna, it's gonna do good. So we did experiments, and um, experiments show that if you take an experimental chamber with an easy built up next to some hydrophilic surface, if you put a little bit of aspirin in the water in doses or concentrations that are similar to the concentrations that, that we would take with one, one or two or three aspirin, it builds easy water. And, and the buildup can be really impressive. So, um, so we think that this is possible, that possibly the way that aspirin um, uh, can, can work through the buildup of, of easy water. On the other hand, it's also known uh, that if you take too many aspirins, you might die. Um, and people will suicide with overdose of aspirin. So we also checked high concentrations of aspirin, and we find that high concentrations diminish the amount of easy water. And so if you've removed the easy water from inside the cell, the proteins then are operating in an environment that's completely unnatural, and they can't fold the way they're supposed to fold. And so the organ doesn't function. It doesn't matter whether it's the kidney or the brain or the heart or whatever. And so you die. We discussed, we, we uh, studied a half dozen or so um, common, common substances that are known, widely known, to be healthful. So what are they? We discovered, we, we studied um, uh, coconut water, for example. We studied Tulsi. And um, uh, we discovered, I can't remember all of them. There are something like a half dozen different ones, uh, probiotics as well. Every one that we studied um, that has been touted as being good for your health, every one of them 
increased the amount of easy water. And we also tried the opposite, um, substances that are not good for your health, to see what they did. And uh, one of them already published is aspirin, uh, is, I'm sorry, is anesthetics. We tried three different anesthetics. Anesthetics block function. They do it transiently. And we found with three different, um, uh, one general and two local anesthetics, that they diminished the size of the EZ uh, in a reversible way. And recently, we were, we were studying glyphosate. As you may know, glyphosate's the main ingredient in Roundup, and it's an herbicide. And, and so, well, how does it act? How does it kill plants? Well, we found that it powerfully diminishes the amount of easy water in concentrations that, um, in, in low concentrations. And so, so we think it's, it's possible that some of these naturally occurring um, agents that improve health and also ones that diminish health, they may all, or some of them at least, operate um, on a mechanism that involves either a buildup or a diminution of easy water. So the easy water, I guess to summarize, the easy water that's in your cell is absolutely critical for, for, for function. And when you're born, you got a lot of it. When you're my age, instead of being 80% water, you're 60% water. And that, that reduction of water is occurring actually inside and outside your cells. And so why we're told to remain well hydrated? Basically, to build the easy water and restore function. You know, pH is one of those difficult things. So uh, usually, pH is measured in a liquid. So you take, you take a, a sulfuric acid and you, you put the probe in and it gives you a pH of two or three, whatever, whatever it does. And you take a base and you do the same. Um, and you have various levels of pH to indicate the degree of acidity or, or al alkalinity. Now, easy is not exactly um, a liquid. It's kind of like in the gel state, the same consistency as raw egg white. And, and so the question is whether, wh whether the pH value is meaningful. So I'm not sure of the answer. Um, however, we do know that, that, that alkaline substances usually contain OH minus, and so OH minus is a tendency toward negativity. And, and um, we've measured the pH of, of the easy water. Uh, and it does tend to be, or the charge tends to be negative, and the pH tends to be high, which is basically alkaline. So, so the answer is yes and no. Uh, it, it, uh, I, I'm, I'm questioning the meaning of the measurement of pH when you don't have a liquid. Uh, but if you accept that it does have some meaning, then it's alkaline. So you can actually, uh, you can buy the alkaline water, um, I guess, in, in the supermarket. By the way, there are dozens, if not scores, of different waters that are touted, you can buy, that are touted to be good for your health. And um, I'll get back to that in a moment. I think some of them really are good for your health. But, but regarding the, the alkaline water, so I, I wondered myself about that. There, there, there are machines now that produce it. So they take your water supply, and, and uh, there are two electrodes, negative and positive, and the water is run by those two electrodes. And what comes out is the one that, that runs by the negative electrode uh, is actually alkaline in nature, and the one that runs by the positive one has a very low pH, and, and it's acidic in nature. And the acidic one, you throw away uh, or use it to kill bacteria. Uh, it's not drinkable. If you were to imbibe it, you'd spit it out. I've done it. Uh, it's not very pleasant. But the alkaline one actually is very pleasant. It feels smooth to your taste. And, and, and the question that many people have raised is, is it good for your health? And um, so I, I don't know the answer, because we, we haven't studied it. But I can tell you that in Japan, um, my colleague, who have, has done extensive research studies and has demonstrated many health benefits uh, of it, he said that some years ago, um, the, the first such machine actually comes from, from Japan. And right now, something like 
30% of households have such a machine. They don't always use it, but they, they have these machines. It's called Kangen uh, water. And, and some people raised objections as to whether it really had health benefits. And so a clinical trial was undertaken in Japan. And the clinical trial, according to my colleague, proved so positive, so effective, that right now, if you're Japanese, if you have any kind of gastrointestinal issue that runs in your body from your mouth to your rear end, doesn't matter where, the first thing they do is they tell you to drink this water, and the Japanese government pays for it. So if the government pays for it, as, as we all know, um, there's got to be some substance, otherwise governments are not thrilled about paying for, for anything. So it's possible that the alkaline water may, may have uh, really positive effects. I think it's important to, to listen also to the detractors and hear what they have to say, but I think on balance, uh, alkaline water appears to have health benefits. There, there, are, there are other waters I, um, I, I gotta tell you about, about one of these. Uh, you know, many of them, someone will come to me because they know that I've studied water and I organize the annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water, and I edit the water journal, et cetera, et cetera. So they like to come to me to tell them about their particular water. And I, I listen to their story, and you know, in, in many cases, it sounds, it sounds convincing that they have something that's not snake oil, that is something uh, beyond there. But one, one, one phone, phone call really made an impression, uh, one contact. It was from a guy who contacted me five years ago, and he said he was working in a laboratory with a famous researcher. Unfortunately, uh, his name is Rustam Roy, and unfortunately he died. Uh, this is a world-class researcher, and some of the equipment in his lab was taken by the students and postdocs and such in the lab. And this guy took a piece of equipment that took water and converted it into a different kind of water through some kind of electromagnetic um, ra radiant energy. And he told me that he, he took it to his house and he was so convinced about this water that he and his family drank the water. They kept uh, drinking it and he said, after two years, he said, nobody in his family ever got the flu or even a common cold. So I yawned. <laughs> And I said, okay, no big deal. So then he said, he said, uh, but there's something interesting. He said, next door neighbor has a, has a friend who was on dialysis and on the list for a kidney transplant. And, you know, they just didn't know what to do. They were at their wit's end. And so they decided that it was interesting to try for that patient to drink this kind of water to see if it had some positive effect. And he told me on the phone, he said that originally this person had irreversible kidney pathology, and, but it was reversed merely by drinking this water for a month or so. So my response was, I don't believe you. Actually, I did, but uh, so he said, I'll send you the hospital records. He sent me the hospital records, and sure enough, this woman, a photocopy, this woman had irreversible kidney pathology on one date and um, examined 30 days later. Mysterious, somehow, miracle pathology disappeared. So I was impressed enough to invite him to the next year's conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. And by that time, he had multiple patients uh, with, with the same result. And, you know, it, it, it seemed nothing short of astonishing that that was the case. And one person from that meeting, who was actually one of the co-organizers, uh, went to visit his place <coughs> in the idea of maybe getting together with him to, um, to convert this into something that, that, that could be made available for humanity instead of a little bit at a time, a trickle of this stuff. And it didn't work out. However, he reported to me that he looked at the hospital records and he interviewed every single one of the patients who this guy claimed was cured, and they confirmed that their pathology was eliminated just by drinking the water. They had to continue drinking it in order to, to maintain their state, but uh, it was reversed. And uh, so, so that impressed me, and by that time, 
they were able to confirm, and I haven't seen the data on that, that they could reverse melanoma. You know, you have a melanoma growth and you take some of this water and put it on a tissue and, and rub it for a certain number of successive days. And after some time, the melanoma is gone. And they also were able to reverse irreversible liver pathology. So, um, I, I'm, I'm not mentioning it to tell everybody to go out and you know, get and find, find that water, but, but it's only because this is one example of a case where somebody has given some kind of energy to the water and that energy has resulted in, in something that appears to be real. I would not be surprised at all if many of the other waters are similar. We've, we've lost sight of the possibility that certain waters can be curative for our health not merely by providing hydration, although that could be part of the, of the mechanism, but by something special about these kinds of waters. You know, we hear about the, the healing waters from Lourdes and from the Ganges and, and other places. These are considered to be holy waters and people go and drink the water and, you know, it appears to be good for health. There may actually be something to it. It may be that those particular waters whose physical chemical properties do differ, I've seen evidence differ from the properties of other waters. It may be that that water could be the wonder drug of the 21st century. Interesting question, um, does water have memory? So I, I gotta tell you a story about this. Um, uh, the short answer I can tell you is yes. And the long answer is a colorful history especially of, um, of people who could, could not conceive of the possibility that, that water could have memory and ruin the careers of several people, in, including one special person who was actually a, a friend of mine named Jacques Benveniste. So the, the, first, the first thought is, is that there's no way that this can have memory. Why is there no way? Well. It's pretty well known that the water molecules in here are bouncing around randomly at a gazillion times per, per second. And so if the individual molecules are moving around so rapidly and mixing and having random orientations, you can't really pinpoint any one of these molecules. And so it's hard to imagine that this could store information. And with that in mind, um, uh, some, some people began uh, studying the phenomenon, not thinking about this, this uh, negative kind of viewpoint that would come out of understanding that these molecules are bouncing around. And that happened uh, about 25 years ago with a, a debacle that took place in the field of water research and I'll tell you the, the story because it's pretty interesting. There was a famous scientist, his name is Jacques Benveniste, and he was an immunologist, very high level scientist um, in, from France who got his medical degree, I think it was, um, or maybe it was a PhD or maybe both, and then went to uh, La Jolla, California, studied some more, and went back, and he was connected somehow with the Pasteur Institute. And he was regarded as a top-level immunologist and devised several methodologies that still sit in textbooks and are used by, by many people. So he went back to his laboratory in France, and he had a giant laboratory, more than 50 people in the lab. This is this is a really big enterprise with uh, connections to all top level people in, in France. And he had been investigating a certain kind of white blood cell called basophil. And these, these cells will secrete or release a substance called histamine. And they'll do it when you expose these cells to a certain antibody, they react and their reactions to spew out this, this, uh, this material. It was an interesting experiment. They'd been doing it. And meanwhile, someone came to him. Uh, this guy was a homeopath. And you know, homeopaths produce their, their healing substances by a serial dilution. 
Uh, they, they take a substance and they take one part to nine parts water or 99 parts water, they mix it, they shake it, and then they take one part of that to nine parts water, uh, put it together and uh, shake it. And they keep doing this, you know, up to a hundred times, for example. And so at the end of this, the amount of the original substance that's present should be zero. I mean, you've diluted and diluted and diluted. So all you have left is water. However, this water, the molecules have somehow been in contact with the original substance that was in the water, even though you've diluted that substance out. And so this homeopath came and said, you know, your experiment is pretty interesting. Um, uh, however, I can dilute and dilute and dilute those antibodies that you pour on the cells and I get the same result. He said, impossible, I can't believe it. On the other hand, Jacques was an intellectual and of course he was curious and he said, okay, you know, I've got this laboratory, you can take a, a, a bench in the corner there, do your experiment and show us that you can do this. So he took, took up this portion of the laboratory bench, started his experiment, and, and uh, performed it, and pretty soon everybody in the lab was huddled in that corner to see what this guy could do, because he could actually do what he said he could do, but there was no, no antibody, no substance, because it was so diluted that there was nothing there. And so, so Jacques had uh, perhaps uh, made the fatal mistake of calling it water memory, because the water that was left over after all this apparently had some memory of the original molecules it, with which it, it had contact, otherwise it would never have been able to produce the specific response that it, it produced. Anyway, he decided to publish his work um, and in the ideal publication place to get the maximum exposure still today is a journal called Nature. So he sent his manuscript to the journal Nature and the editor, Sir John Maddox, read it and by the way, the story I'm going to tell you appears in several books, so um, it's not that just I know the story personally, but it's, it's well known. So Maddox uh, looked at it and he wrote back um, to Ben Venist and he said, this is impossible. He said, if you're right, everybody else is wrong and I refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong and therefore we will not publish it. We won't even send it to reviewers. And um, uh, Jacques being a, uh, clever, creative guy, he thought, okay, well, the way to overcome this reaction is to ask other laboratories to do the same experiment and see if they get the same result. So he contacted various friends um, in, in different countries and asked them to repeat the experiment, doing it exactly the way that he did it. And the results turned out positive. They put all the results together from the different laboratories and they submitted again to, uh, to Nature. And the response was the same. I don't care how many laboratories reproduce it, it can't be right because otherwise everything else is wrong. Um, so, you know, being a scientist, uh, you know, what do you do in a case like this? Well, it's, it's very awkward because, because this is not the way science is, is, is done. You know, if someone can replicate what you've you've done and it has to be considered even though the mechanism may be completely obfuscated nobody knows what's going on it's not something we we understand but but the evidence is there and so it's necessary to look at it so before long uh, because he was uh, rejected uh, the people the homeopaths in Paris and there are quite a few homeopaths uh, Jacques was a hero among them because here's this this world-class French scientist who's demonstrated basically that the principles that underlie what they do medically can be confirmed. And, and, and you know, this is no third-rate scientist. This is a, a top guy who's done it. And so pretty soon it appeared in the newspaper in Le Monde um, in, in Paris and the people in the nature people in London got wind of all this and they felt under huge pressure to respond because it looked like they were acting arbitrarily and not, not fairly. So what happened, and when I visited Jacques, he, he died about a decade ago, um, when I visited him at the time in his laboratory, he said, oh, you see that phone there? I got a phone call from 
John Maddox, the editor, and he said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll publish your paper, as is, with a little uh, disclaimer, and they published the disclaimer uh, saying they're not really sure about this, but, um, and I will send a group of peers to come to your laboratory, look over your shoulder, see what you're doing, and report back to our readers in nature. So, knowing that what, what he's been doing is, is correct and could be verified by other laboratories, naively, <laughs> Jacques invited them to come to the laboratory and, and you know, see what was, what was going on. And uh, so they published the paper in Nature. The disclaimer said, you know, we don't necessarily believe this, but in the interest of fairness, we're going to uh, publish it and we'll report back to you in a month or so after our committee of peers goes to Paris, checks the experiment, see what, what's going on. And so that happened. It happened about three weeks after, and, and there were three people on this committee of peers. The first was Maddox himself, who, who was not a biologist. He actually studied physics and dropped out to become a journalist and worked his way up to being the editor of Nature. And the second one was the amazing Randy, that is James Randy, a magician, uh, a world-class magician who who um, um, was able to, uh, um, ha to figure out the tricks of other magicians. He was very well known for, for doing that. And, you know, I've met other various magicians who look up to him in terms of his ability to do, to do tricks like this as, as peerless. That was the second. And, and the third was a guy named Walter Stewart, um, who, who is a fraud buster, who worked at the National Institutes of Health, worked in the Center for Scientific Integrity. So he was the guy, you know, if you were cheating in your experiment, he's the guy who could figure out how you were cheating. So this was not exactly a committee of peers. It was a committee, you know, uh, it was a kind of like a terrorist committee to, designed to, to undermine what was going on. So they went to visit, and I was told by a few people about the visits, and again, um, it's, it's written in, in, in various books. And they did the experiments, and the first day the technician did the experiments, and they turned out exactly as they had reported in the paper. The second day, the technician did all these dilutions and experiments, and again, even though each vial that they used was coded by the visiting committee and decoded by that committee. Still, the experiments worked. And the third day, the dilutions were done by the fraud buster, uh, and, and those experiments didn't show the same results. And so, so they huddled in their hotel, and they decided that, well, when the French people do the experiments, they worked, as they described. But when the visiting committee did the experiments once, uh, didn't work, and therefore it must be a trick. And, 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 and so they published in Nature that this was a, a, a water memory is a delusion. In other words, a, a kind of magician's trick. This guy's career went from, um, from a formidable scientist, a world-class scientist, to a scientific joke. And as the joke went, you know, you're having trouble remembering? Well, just drink some of this water uh, that Ben Venice was using. You know, it will restore your, your memory. And it became a scientific joke. And, and out of that scientific joke, Ben Venice lost his laboratory. Um, nobody would fund him. Uh, the French government, I met somebody who was involved in that. It's not that they didn't believe him, it's just that you know, the, that French science was discredited. Uh, French scientists, uh, we have Lavoisier, Pasteur, uh, the great mathematicians, and then there's water memory. And so this put a damper on, um, on everything that French science had, had produced. And so with this, his being discredited, uh, it, water memory went down the drain as a scientific joke. And, you know, the premise on, on which this joke is built is that the water molecules are bouncing around randomly and there's simply no possibility that they could ever retain information. 
However, and this is the, <laughs> this is the however, we found the EZ water, and the EZ water is like a crystal. Uh, all of the hydrogens and oxygens are sitting in place, in a fixed place, just like a, just like a, a crystal um, that, that's used in a, in a memory stick. You know, these are based on silica, and, and the water case is based on oxygen and, and hydrogen. And in the case of the standard digital memory, you know, each, each atom could either be a zero or a one. Um, and in, in the case of the water, each oxygen could be, see, each oxygen has oxidation states of five different ones. Minus two is the most common one that we know. It could be minus one, zero, even plus one, and plus two. And, and therefore, it has the capacity of having five different states, each one, not just two as in a digital memory, but five. And so the capacity, not only does the easy water have capacity for memory, but it has enormous capacity for, uh, for memory. And therefore, at least theoretically, the, the idea that water, or easy water particularly, that easy water could store information is absolutely, in theory, available. Now what about the experiments? Well, experiments have been done for years, and as I mentioned, in our conference on, on water, our annual conference, there are always two or three people who come and present objective evidence that water can retain information. So you can measure the properties of, of the water by using spectroscopic techniques, which, which measure how much energy is absorbed at each of a series of wavelengths. Then you put some kind of electromagnetic energy into the water, and then you measure again, and the water has changed. So some information is, is retained. And, and by now, this is uh, among the group of scientists who come to this annual meeting. This is taken as pretty much as a fact. It's not, not even a theory. It's been confirmed enough times. And the question is to figure out what is exactly the molecular mechanism or, of, of, of what's going on. So, so I'm sorry, that was a long answer, but the quick answer is yes, if you look objectively at the evidence, there's plenty of evidence for water memory, and the theoretical basis exists. Yeah, I've seen the crystals, and I've been involved in, in the studies of those crystals. So you're talking, uh, I think, pretty much about um, Emoto, yep. the, the um, Japanese fellow. And uh, uh, I, I will precede this by saying that I never met him. Um, However, I invited him two times to the water conference, and both times he had to drop out because he was ill, and he, he really was ill. And the second time, his illness was serious enough that he died. That was a couple of years ago. And I was really disappointed, uh, obviously, you know, in his death, but also we had invited him to dinner in Seattle, in my home, and it was scheduled, the date was clear, and unfortunately, about six weeks before that, he, he died. So his, uh, you know, Emoto was not a scientist. He was, uh, he was a, uh, a healer and a philosopher and a, basically a spiritualist. And what he was able to do, uh, as I think many people know, is he was able to convey a kind of energy to the water. And then when frozen, the crystals uh, uh, of the water would show different patterns. And if the energy was a so-called a positive kind of energy, the crystals would be beautiful. And if it was a negative energy, then it would be ugly. And so the first one I'd heard about is music. And so if you play a Bach cantata to, um, to, to the water and freeze it, then you get something beautiful. But if you play hard rock to the music, then the crystals turn out to be ugly. And that, that was kind of amusing, but you know, gradually, it, it, it became more spiritual in that if you express love to the water uh, and you say, I love you, um, instead of saying, I hate you, then the crystals would turn out differently. And of course, scientists, uh, almost every scientist I know, treats this with some kind of skepticism because you know, it's easily, easy to form 100 crystals and you pick out the one that is, it, it is the kind of, of image that, that you like. And so it's called cherry picking, and, and no scientist um, with, uh, who is objective will say, you know, this is really evidence. And, 
And Emoto admitted to the fact that 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 was the case, and he was not a scientist, he was a spiritualist. I have heard of a group of people who actually exposed these negative and positive images to groups who didn't know whether the picture was done with I love you or I hate you, and they were able actually, just barely statistically significant, to pick out the positive one and the negative one. And um, the, the, maybe the most famous experiment done by a whole, whole bunch of people is to put, put rice in containers, and to one container, I love you, and the other one, I hate you, and there was a third one, just ignored, completely ignored. And after uh, a week or so, the one that was ignored became rotten and smelly, and the one, the I hate you, did the same, but the I love you one remained fresh. And apparently this has been repeated by many people, including a good friend of mine who, who I trust and who works with the Emoto group. So despite the fact that Emoto passed, the, the Emoto um, um, uh, group uh, and, and their endeavors persist. And one of them is, is uh, the peace movement, uh, trying to, to bring peace through water and an understanding of water that's going on all around the world to, to teach teachers <coughs> with little books that are written and are passed out free to link water and um, goodwill passed on to the water, to teach the children uh, about this, to bring peace to the world, and also scientific studies going on. So I was invited there six months ago uh, to give a series of talks, and, and um, uh, one of them was, was to <coughs> a general audience, a day, uh, and another day to, to an audience of scientists. And it was among the more pleasurable days of my life because the, the response was, was amazing. And one of the reasons um, was that the, the fourth phase of water could be, I'm not sure it is, it could be the scientific basis of all that they found because the fourth phase of water has a structure not so different from ice. We found experimentally if you take water and you freeze it, it must go through this easy phase before it gets converted to ice. And if you melt the water, it must go through this easy phase in order to turn to, to water. See, so this is a critical intermediate phase. And this is the phase that's crystalline. It's the phase where it's demonstrated that you can put information in and this information is retained. So you see, what we do is we provi provide a possible physical scientific link that could explain the results of what Emoto has been presenting. And, and, and I think that's the reason why this, is, this material is received so well by the, by the Emoto people. And you know, I feel these people are actually like part of my family now. They're, they're so warm and wonderful uh, people. I recommend anybody who has any interest in Japan and Tokyo to go visit them. There is finally one thing I, I would, would like to add, and it's only loosely related to what I've been uh, talking about, um, or actually there are two things. The, the first of all is, is that this experimental work that we've done uh, actually leads to practical consequences. So um, what, what we found, first of all, is is that this water has a couple of interesting properties that lead to technologies. And, and the first one is that um, this is easy water is charged. Usually it's negatively charged. And the water that's adjacent to it or beyond it is positively charged. Because this arises from the splitting of water molecules. And the negative parts go to, to form the easy. And the positive parts are just protons or hydronium ions sitting in the water. So you have separated charge. It's just like a battery you know, with the two terms, one's positive, one's negative. If you stick electrodes in the negative, one in the negative, one in the positive, and connect them to a lamp, you can light the lamp. All of this comes from water and light. And, um, and so it is possible to harvest energy from the sun, for example, uh, and water. And you can do this without depleting the earth of its natural resources, which are usually used to make photovoltaic cells. It's one of the disadvantages. This uses just water. And the efficiency of, of the process seems to be very high. The first step of photosynthesis, 
which is, is well known, is light hits the water, is absorbed by some hydrophilic material, chromophore, and the water splits into OH minus and H plus, just the same as we found, except what we found is perhaps more generic than the particular reaction that occurs in photosynthesis. This splitting is thought by the biochemists to be 100% efficient. So, by capitalizing on this separation of charge um, and the light that creates it, we can harvest electrical energy and we have a patent on it. And a company is now developing this to see if we can provide for the world um, a, a source of energy from, from the sun without depleting the earth of, it, of its resources. It's in its beginning state. A lot of development is needed, but we're doing that. There's a second one, um, and that is the easy water is like a crystal. When crystals form, it's sort of just like when ice forms. Ice forms a perfect crystal, and anything that's in the water as the ice forms gets pushed out, gets ejected. It's the same as the EZ. As the EZ forms, it ejects almost everything from it to form the crystal. And, and so the EZ water is actually uh, contaminant-free water. It's not necessarily free of every single one, but most of the ones we've tried are excluded from it. And therefore, if you put water into, into our, our system that creates EZ water, and you pull out this EZ water, this EZ water is practically, practically free of contaminants. You might put bacteria in there, or viruses in there, or, or some chemicals, and it basically excludes them. So if you collect this, this water, you basically have a filter that has filtered out all the junk in the water, and you have a water that is, is not only essentially contaminant-free, but also has the health benefits of being easy water. And there's no physical filter that gets dirty and you need to change and throw out. It's, uh, it, it, it works on the principle of the energy of light. And so we're, the company is also working on, on building uh, this one. And obviously, we need this because the um, waters are getting progressively more contaminated with all manner of substances, uh, including pharmaceuticals that we dump down the drink, chemicals that the body has basically are foreign uh, to, to the body, and other kinds of pollutants. So we hope that these will actually um, come to, to fruition. There was another point that I was going to make. In a, oh yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, another, another point that I guess I want to end with is, is um, an organization <coughs> that we've built. And this organization is not really related to water in the, any direct way. But the theme <coughs> is similar. It's called the Institute for Venture Science. And by venture science, we mean science um, that ventures into, into the real unknown and tries to look at ideas that challenge the current wisdom. And many of the ideas that we read about in the textbook seem to be, in some sense, in, invalid. They don't explain all the evidence. But today, science has actually uh, shifted from what science used to be, and this organization is designed to counter that. So 100 years ago, uh, there were scientific breakthroughs and, if you will, revolutions that occurred practically by the year, even. Um, there was Einstein and Max Planck and, and Curie. and All these people were producing um, scientific revolutions um, that were today they've come to be known as scientific revolutions, and even then they were considered to be such. And today, if you, if you think, if, if someone asks you, um, could you tell me uh, scientific revolutions that have occurred in the past, say, 20 or 30 years, I've asked scientists and uh, I've asked lay people the same question about that, and the response is, what, what are you talking about? And the first response is, well, look at the iPhone. But I'm talking, I'm talking not about technological developments, which are many, of course, but I'm talking about fundamental scientific revolutions, equivalent, let's say, to uh, the, the, the structure of the, of the genome, structure of DNA, that was about 60 years ago, 
or um, the splitting of the atom that was 70 years ago. Those are, you know, fundamental scientific r revolutions. And, and are there any that are equivalent today? People struggle, scientists struggle and lay people struggle to, to identify them. And although so much money goes into science today, especially compared with 100 years ago, and yet there are so few scientific revolutions. And the, the reason is that the institutions that are responsible for governing a science actually put dampers on, on uh, restrictions on people whose ideas deviate from the mainstream. So it's the academic institutions and the funding agencies. So for example, if, if, if I come through with an idea that the earth is round and everybody knows that the earth is flat, and I send my idea to a, a granting agency, I say, well, you know, I, I think everybody believes the earth is flat, but I've seen satellite images and, you know, they show, they show curvature. And, and by the way, I took off from Seattle and I went west and I went all the way around and I came back to Seattle. So, you know, it appears that the earth might be round. Please give me some money so I can study this in more detail because, you know, if it turns out that the earth is round instead of flat, this will be uh, really important for, for the future of, uh, of science and, and humanity. So what happens is it, it, it goes and the gatekeeper at, at the scientific funding institute says, oh, this looks pretty important. I have to find some reviewers to find out whether, whether this is trivial stuff or really important as it kind of looks. So, I'm going to find the most prominent people in the field to review, review this round earth idea. And who are those people? They're the flat earth people. So a round earth proposal going to a flat earth reviewer. And the reviewer thinks, uh-oh, <laughs> if this guy is really right, my career is on the line because I've made my reputation on demonstrating all the details of flat earth, you know, the bumps and, and, and whatever. If this guy is right, my whole career is irrelevant. So obviously the kind of response is one of self-protection. And, and, and so <coughs> we don't want to think that, that um, this radical idea is correct. And the easiest way to handle that is to say, well, I think we shouldn't give money to support this scientific research because, because, um, because, because of the Wizard of Oz. You know, you can easily invent he should have tried, he should have proposed this method instead of that one. There's always a reason why it doesn't quite make the cut. This happens all the time. And scientists who are really canny and who understand the system will almost never propose a radical idea. It's necessary to propose something new, but just a little bit different from, from the accepted view. If you challenge head on, it's like, uh, the French revolutionary saying, hey, you know, Louis XIV, we, we don't quite like what you're doing and we'd like you to consider our point of view. Well, off with your head. I, you know, th this, is, this is the uh, kind of situation. And as a result of this, as a result of the increasing dominance of the granting institutions and, and the academic institutions which receive money from them and, and support them, there are very few radical ideas that can gain any traction. So the Institute for Venture Science is designed to counteract that. We take money from uh, wealthy individuals who want to do something meaningful for humanity. And if any of you know such people, uh, I think many people who, um, who have gained wealth want to give back. And this is a way of giving back in a way that you can help to create something that's enduring and important. And the URL for, for the Institute for Venture Science is simple. It's uh, www.iinstitute, um, v, IVS, Institute for Venture Science, uh, sorry, IVSCI, S-C-I, I-V-S-C-I dot org. And you can check that and you can find many details and we'd be happy to, to uh, talk to you. Thank you.